Terrorism, edited by ASER researcher Dr. Christoph Pelusen and Professor Martin Scheinen. Uh, my colleague, Christoph Pelusen, who is a senior researcher at the ASER Institute and a research fellow um, at the ICCT in The Hague, will open this evening by giving you some context uh, for the book we are launching tonight, as well as an overview of the contents of the book, after which Martin Scheinen, who is Professor of International Law and Human Rights at the European University Institute, and also well known for being the first UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights and Counterterrorism from 2005 to 2011, will explore a key uh, concept of the book that he also delves into in his uh, chapter, uh, that is the concept of human security and the phenomenon of humanization of the security discourse. Uh, we are absolutely thrilled and delighted to have with us some of the authors of the book who will share with us and discuss the findings of their chapter. Um, so let me introduce you um, uh, briefly uh, our speakers and apologies in advance. This is just a, a brief selection of their impressive background. So uh, without further ado, tonight's speakers uh, are Dr. Rumiana van Ark. I have the pleasure of having her as a colleague. She is a postdoctoral researcher in terrorism, counterterrorism, and international law at the Asser Institute. She's also researcher, uh, research fellow and uh, coordinator of the ICCT, the International Center for Counterterrorism, which co-organizes this event. Um, her work focuses on the impact of counterterrorism measures on the individual terror suspect and the long-term implications of these measures for the rule of law and our societies. Rumiana holds her uh, PhD in law from the University of Durham, an LLM in criminology and criminal justice from the University College Dublin, and a BA um, that she got with honors uh, on legal studies and business uh, from uh, Nottingham Trent University. Professor Helen Duffy holds the Giscus Chair in International Humanitarian Law and Human Rights at the Grotius Center of Leiden University. Welcome. Uh, she's Honorary Professor of International Law at the University of Glasgow, Senior Fellow at the University of Melbourne, and Visiting Professor at the American University. She has an LLB from the University of Glasgow, an LLM from the UCL, and a Diploma in Legal Practice from the University of Edinburgh, and of course uh, a PhD that she did at the University of Leiden. Um, the third chapter that uh, will be presented to us was co-authored by Dr. Laura Van Vaas uh, and Sangita Jagai. Uh, so uh, Laura, I believe, will present the chapter and Sangita will be available to uh, tackle your questions during the Q&A. So Sangita is uh, at the final stage of her PhD at Tilburg University. Uh, her thesis uh, focuses on the concept of nationality deprivation and she assesses why different forms of denationalization are deemed legitimate by some states and when nationality deprivation on the contrary is arbitrary under international law. Um, Dr. Laura Van Vaas is assistant professor at the Department of European and International Law at Tilburg Law School as well as uh, founder and uh, co-director of the Institute on Statelessness and Inclusion. Um, as part of her broader work on statelessness and the right to a nationality, Dr. Van Vaas has engaged extensively uh, on this issue of nationality deprivation. And her uh, institute is cur currently spearheading uh, something that you want to uh, keep an eye on. Uh, it's a year of action that they're organizing against citizenship stripping, including uh, through uh, the promotion of adherence uh, to uh, recently launched principles on deprivation of nationality as a national security measure. So welcome to you all. Thanks a lot for joining us. Um, each of the chapter will be presented for about 10 minutes and we will then open the floor uh, to questions. Note, of course, that you can already uh, send your questions in the chat box to all panelists. 
Um, and uh, if you have a questions for a specific speaker, you can uh, also specify it in the chat box. Otherwise, um, no need to specify anything. Uh, the, the evening will uh, be closed by Frank Backer, publisher of TMC Acer Press. Uh, he will end uh, the, this evening with a few words to close this uh, book launch celebration um, as he should. Uh, but uh, for now, uh, Christophe and Martin, big congrats uh, on uh, the book's publication from my side. And uh, Christophe, the floor is yours. Thank you, Rebecca, for that very kind introduction and for organizing and moderating this festive launch. Um, in the next seven and a half minutes or so, I will briefly provide some context for the book we're launching today, as well as an overview of the contents of the book. And finally, I would like to thank a number of people. Um, but let's first start with the context. It appears that terrorism is on the retreat. Yeah, for example, according to the Global Terrorism Index, or GTI 2019, Deaths from terrorism fell for the fourth consecutive year after peaking in 2014. However, if we zoom out a little bit, it becomes clear that terrorism, despite the drop we are currently witnessing, should still be considered a serious and widespread phenomenon. Even if looking at numbers only, it cannot be compared to the current COVID-19 crisis we're going through right now. So in 2018, the number of deaths from terrorism was still almost three times the number as recorded in 2001. And also in 2018, 71 countries experienced at least one death from terrorism, which is the second highest number of countries recording one or more deaths in the past 20 years. Now, whereas the impact of terrorism in Western countries is incomparable, and when looking at the situation, for instance, Afghanistan or Iraq, Nigeria, Syria, and Pakistan, the five countries most impacted by terrorism, according to the GTI 2019, also the former countries have had their fair share of terrorism activity. And this terrorism threat overlapping with the phenomenon of foreign fighters and who have traveled en masse and from all over the world to the conflict in Syria and Iraq has led to what Amnesty International, focusing on Europe, has called the fast expanding security state and the disturbing Orwellian trend as a result of which the boundaries between the powers of the state and the rights of individuals are being redrawn. And Europe's human rights framework, which was so carefully constructed after the Second World War, is being rapidly dismantled. Now, also the former United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights, Al Hussein, warned in 2015 more generally, so not limiting himself to Europe, and I quote, terrorist attacks cannot destroy the values on which our societies are grounded, but laws and policies can. Now, despite different views on its exact meaning, one of the values on which our societies is grounded is human dignity which underpins the entire human rights regime. At the same time, human dignity and human rights more generally are often balanced against security thinking. Now, our book has critically analyzed human dignity and human security challenges in the lead up and in the responses to current forms of terrorism. And it aims to show how human dignity and human security can be secured and how law can constitute a source of trust in times of terrorism. Having provided some context, let's zoom in a bit more on the book itself. It is divided in three parts, and part one sets the conceptual scene and includes a chapter by Ernst Hirschbalin on restoring trust in the rule of law, as well as Martin Chinese chapter arguing indeed for the humanization of the security discourse. And I'm sure he will address that interesting point in more detail in his own talk. Part two of the book contains seven chapters addressing various actors, operations, and measures of interest in our current times of terrorism, including the chapters authored by Helen Duffy and Sangeeta Jagai and Laura Van Baas. And in my view, Helen's chapter huh, on the astounding and Kafkaesque case study of her client and rendition and torture victim, Abu Zabeda, shows the reader in the clearest way possible that human dignity is not only interesting from a more conceptual or academic point of view, but also has practical and profound ramifications for actual people in real life. The chapter by Sangeeta and Laura concerns a topic that's very dear to my heart, the deprivation of nationality as a counterterrorism measure. And they explain, among other things, how this measure is different from other counterterrorism measures, mentioning the far-reaching consequences uh, denationalization has for the persons concerned, as well as the inequality inherent in the implementation of citizenship stripping in practice. And later during this webinar, you will hear more about both chapters. The second part of the book also includes contribution on exporting human security in the cause of counterterrorism by Clive Walker on human security versus national security and anti-terrorism operations by Sofia Galani, 
on state accountability for counterterrorism intelligence cooperation by Sophie Duroy, on the law and policy of China's People's War on Terror by Daniel Sprick, and finally on the scope of a broader range of foreign fighting going beyond the counterterrorism context by Marnie Lloyd. The third and final part of the book contains four chapters focusing specifically on the criminal justice context, and it contains chapters by Tariq Kherbaoui on criminalizing foreign fighter travel in order to prevent terrorism in Europe, by Stephanie de Kunzel on incitement to terrorism, and by Ariana Bedaski on the humiliation of terrorism victims. And the final chapter of this part and the book is authored by Romiana van Ark, Nikos Danova, and Charlotte Renkes. And they look into the question how courts and the ultimate assessors of the legality of many of the measures discussed in our book handle the issue of secret evidence. And Romiana will go into more depth during her presentation during this webinar. Finally, I would like to take this opportunity to thank my co-editor Martin Scheine for our excellent cooperation and all the authors of this book for their in-depth research and thought-provoking insights. And of course, a special thank you eh, to the authors who are willing uh, to present the findings during this webinar. And I'm sure I also speak on behalf of Martin when I say we would also like to thank Kim Lane Schepeler for writing the foreword to our book, as well as all the speakers, moderators, and participants of the December 2017 conference on the same topic during which initial drafts of the chapters were presented and discussed. In addition, we would like to thank Frank Bakker and Kiki van Geurp from Team C Asa Press for their trust and education. And last but definitely not least, our editorial assistant, Kilian Reutmeyer, should be praised for his arduous but crucial work in making sure that all the chapters were put in the required format. Now, we hope that this book will not only inspire academics uh, through further theorization on the sometimes elusive but important concepts of human dignity and human security, but also practitioners working in the field of counterterrorism. And that these chapters may convince them even more that following a human rights approach will be indispensable in securing human dignity and human security for all, even, or we should actually say, especially in times of terrorism. So thank you, Rebecca, and over to you. Thank you very much, Christoph. Uh, Martin, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And I think I will start by thanking Christoph, who was, uh, let's say, the lead editor who carried most of the weight and pulled me to do my little share in the editing process. It was a pleasant book to edit because of the quality of the leadership through the Azar Institute, as well as the high caliber of the contributors. We had a, a high ranking, substantively high ranking workshop at the Azar Institute, which was never the intention that it, this would be a conference report, no. It was a point of departure where people presented their ideas and the papers, and then there was a long process of putting together a book which hopefully is coherent and concise at the same time and really makes a thematic contribution. I want to thank, uh, besides Christoph, all the staff uh, at the Asser Institute who contributed towards this exercise. And uh, still in the thanks section, I want to refer to the International Association of Constitutional Law which has uh, arranged annually similar workshops on thema thematic issues related to the fight against terrorism and its constitutional or international law, human rights law dimensions, uh, uh, usually uh, then resulting in a book. The publishers have varied, the formats have varied, but, but there is a aim to uh, produce some level of academic excellence so that it's it's uh, it's possible to go ahead with a book and Kim Lane Sheppel's introduction forward in the book uh, represents that because she's uh, she's the current chair of the IACL uh, research group on uh, constitutional issues in the fight against terrorism and of course I want to mention that I was the founding father of that group and happy to uh, be the 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 midwife of the collaboration between that group and the Azar Institute in what now we can see between the covers of this book. As Rebecca mentioned, I will uh, say something about the conceptual issues. I think it's, a, it's an innovation, it's a contribution to the field that we link together human dignity and human security. They sound symmetrical, they both are structured by qualifying uh, a substantive with the adjective human. 
but they come from very different fields. Human dignity is a philosophical foundation for human rights law. So there's a philosophical legal discourse that we refer when we speak about human dignity. It is a, not a human right on its own. It is a background value for human rights, but it's a philosophical, ethical, moral test to the application, for the application of human rights law. Whereas then security comes from the tough life of politics, international relations, even military dominance, where security often equates uh, militarization. And we have the notions of uh, national security or public security, which so much have governed the counterterrorism debate. And often there is a question, how do we balance security versus human rights? And then the answer is a given. Security is more important than an individual's rights. So security always wins in that equation. So what we now say, we take the human security notion which is more from the international relations or international politics field rather than philosophy or law. And we try to operationalize it in respect of human rights law. And we get the nice symmetrical combination of uh, human dignity and human security. And I think we are able in this book, and I'm doing my part in my little chapter, in, uh, in, in trying to show that we need a humanization of the security discourse in order to make counterterrorism compatible with human rights. It's not enough simply to take the human dignity approach or the approach based on separate uh, specific human rights. I think we must also frame the security discourse so that we seek to humanize it and, and ask the question, what ultimately matters is not the borders of a state. It's not the leadership of the state and their survival. It's not the military or the military industrial complex. It is really the lives of peoples that should be the, uh, the, the, the uh, underlying, as govern the underlying aspirations, why we speak about security. Christoph referred briefly to the COVID-19 pandemic and of course, it's quite important today and for this event simply to note that every single day since 27 March has meant a greater loss of human lives than 9-11. We speak about 9-11 20 years later as an unprecedented catastrophe which has dictated the course of politics at the world ever since then. But we should think of the same in respect of the COVID uh, pandemic and all the devastation it has caused. We knew all the time that there were terrible uh, epidemics and other illnesses in the South, which was killing scores of people, more than 9-11 ever. But now we know that we have in the West and in the world uh, in front of our uh, TV sets or our uh, computer screens, the deadly death toll from a global pandemic. And we need to put the counterterrorism issue into a perspective. So we must not allow counterterrorism to hijack uh, the response to COVID-19. It's rather the opposite. The response to COVID needs to be human rights centered and human centered. And that will also show the way for a human security based approach to counterterrorism. Uh, human dignity, of course, is a Kantian notion. And from there, I want simply to refer that uh, for my contribution, there will be a part two, which will be in the next volume from the annual IACL uh, uh, research group on constitutional responses to terrorism conferences. It was held in Bocconi one year later, and uh, we will have a book out with Cambridge University Press, but, but we should first sell and read this book. But that, that, that uh, chapter I'm contributing there deals with redefining terrorism from the perspective of human dignity and human security. I won't tell you the 
secrets. Now I just uh, want to demonstrate that this is an important contribution, the book we are announcing, celebrating tonight, but it also provides a basis for further research and further discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for uh, this short presentation of the conceptual framework uh, of the book. I'm sure that will be very helpful and also a source of inspiration to trigger a discussion afterwards. Uh, I will now give the floor to uh, Rumiana, um, who will talk to us about the normalization of secrecy in the United Kingdom and the Netherlands. Um, and the floor is your, yours, Rumiana. Um, thanks very much, Rebecca, for your kind introduction. Um, I also want to start with a few words of thanks, uh, first to Christoph and to Martin for um, inviting me and allowing me to be part of the book. Uh, and thank you for the editorial process. It was very constructive and very helpful and very much appreciated. And to Charlotte, um, who is working for the Euro European Commission now, but who used to be an intern at ASER when we wrote this together and she really helped me with the research of the Dutch cases and actually translating them for me. It was immensely valuable and I hope she's in the audience. And with that, I will very quickly uh, go through um, the chapter. It was a long process, uh, which I'll try to uh, summarize in about eight and a half, nine minutes. Uh, there's three main things uh, that are the pillars really of the chapter that I contributed. The ritualism of counterterrorism and the impact that it has on lawmaking in the context of responses to terrorism. The, what I refer to as intelligence intoxication post 9-11 and the increasing and normalized use of secret evidence um, within some countries, but most prominently the UK, but also countries such as the Netherlands and the impact that that has both in terms of court structures and procedures and more broadly for the right to fair trial. Um, if we look at the ritualism and counterterrorism first, it is very much a ritualized pattern by now um, in the aftermath of a terrorism act that states and governments in particular tend to ask themselves, have we done enough? Have we legislated enough? What should we do to prevent another act of terrorism? Which tends to lead normally to very speedy process of additional legislation even if it's um, controversial or very onerous legislation, partly because governments need to be seen to respond and to act quickly, partly because legislators need to be seen to also respond and they don't want to be seen as being afraid of the concept of security or afraid that they're not acting tough enough. But there's another pattern that emerges after every act of terrorism, regardless of where it is, and this is the tensions between individual liberty and national security demands. And we can see that in the aftermath of a terrorism act, these, this tension really tends to rise. Now, it tends to be referred to in the literature as individual liberty versus national security, but in many respects, it's much more appropriate to refer to it as due process or fair trial protections versus security considerations, if we are to take that approach. And if we look at counter transnational and domestic counterterrorism measures, for example, indefinite detention in black sites or in extraordinary conditions that Helen will talk about, they're very illustrative examples of where security demands have substantially eclipsed the importance of protecting human dignity. In more recent times, this is very much the case in the context of deprivation of liberty, uh, deprivation of citizenship, I should say. And this tension is really important because as the use of secret evidence within the court, courts will show this is not something that happens in the immediate aftermath of an act of terrorism when sometimes states either call for a state of emergency or trigger legally a state of emergency. This tension can continue on and become embedded for a very, very long time, even when we think that we're in a state of normality. And this tension has been also reinforced, at least from our point of view, by a significant development that has been driving the decision-making of governments and legislature since 
bilateral and multilateral intelligence cooperation and sharing have become an indispensable feature in the post 9-11 world in domestic and transnational defense and national security strategies and have led to what I call, I refer to as the phenomenon of intelligence information intoxication. Now, what do I mean? What do we mean by this um, phrase? Well, if we look at how states have approached national security and prevention of terrorism domestically, we can see that the more traditional crime prevention methods seem to feature less prominently in the overall counterterrorism toolkits of states. Under the justifications of early preemption of terrorism threats, of transnational nature of the threat, of a changing nature of the threat of terrorism, governments have relied more and more and more on bulk surveillance or communication interception, collection and exchange of intelligence information. Bilateral and multilateral intelligence cooperation is certainly not a new phenomenon. We can see that by existence of organizations such as NATO and Europol and Interpol and agreements such as the Five Eyes and the Nine Nines Intelligence Alliances. But what has happened, particularly after 9-11, is that the scope of intelligence cooperation and exchange has broadened to embrace a really wide range of intelligence partners, including partners who were previously seen as non-aligned or hostile states. Even the smaller states, which previously were assessed as intelligence unproductive or ill-disposed, are now seen as a potential source of terrorism or terrorism-related activity and as such a very valuable intelligence partner. Another development linked to this is the increasing reliance and by now entrenched reliance on private security companies which are tasked with data collection and processing simply because the exchange of information, collection of information is so vast that it requires an additional body and infrastructure to cope with it. To a point that in some countries such as the US, we can actually refer to a public private intelligence services or collaboration of the two rather than just public intelligence services in a traditional sense. Now, as a result of this, combined with the deep commitment to transnational, regional, broad counterterrorism responses, domestic intelligence services now operate in an environment which can be described as an international world for domestic security agencies, a world that flow of information is constant, it requires processing, but also it means that it needs to be utilized. And it's a very natural instinct for both intelligence services and governments that if you have so much collected information, information that is operationally significant, not just in the context of the actual prevention and intelligence side of things, but also that could be utilized in the context of the court proceedings, that you want to be able to use it. So within this environment, combined with this ritualized pattern to have to be seen to respond, to have to legislate, to have to find new means and new measures to respond. It was really unsurprising in our view that governments would seek to find a way to fully exhaust the usefulness of the wealth of intelligence information that they have access to. And the way to do that, the next step is to do it through the domestic courts. And here, the courts can play a very significant and important role, a role that perhaps is not, not always fully appreciated. But a judicial review of an imposed counterterrorism measure can play a key role in the longevity of this counterterrorism measure if there is a finding by the courts that the measure is proportionate and serves a legitimate purpose. In other words, a positive judicial review towards a counterterrorism measure can ensure that this measure stays on the books for quite a longer period of time. And that's important because this is precisely what has happened with these conditional um, models of involving and including intelligence information within court trials. The way the Netherlands and the UK have done this is different, uh, naturally depends on the differences within the legal framework too. Within the UK, 
this has been done through a specialized process called closed material procedure. It was initially started within the Special Immigrations Appeals Commission, but now it's very broad and has been used in a wide range of purposes. Within this procedure, the court can consider secret intelligence evidence without the defendant or his legal team being given access to hear this intelligence evidence. So they're not in the courtroom when this is being examined. They're represented by a special advocate, and it's only the special advocate that has access to the sensitive intelligence evidence that's being presented by the government. However, this special advocate is not actually allowed to discuss this evidence with either the defendant or his core legal team. So they can challenge the evidence, but without necessarily having access to the defendant to check whether there's anything to rebut it. And that causes a lot of complications in terms of defense. Initially, these were perceived as a legal abnormality. They were very heavily criticized. By now, they've been completely normalized and they've been used in a number of cases, such as prescription of terrorist organization, preventative detention, control orders, domestic asset freezing orders, terrorism prevention and investigation measures, and employment disputes, which raise questions of national security. More importantly, this system of involving intelligence evidence has actually been found to be compatible with Article 6 of the European Court of Human Rights in more recent cases, which uh, raises a lot of questions in relation whether law can be used and can be weaponized in a way to have a punitive function in the context of human rights and counterterrorism. And that's a broader discussion to have. The framework within the Netherlands is a little bit different, and actually, domestic courts in the Netherlands have been much more, uh, have challenged the government much more on it, and as such, has been quite a lot less cases, but nevertheless. Uh, intelligence evidence has been examined in the context of imposing a criminal conviction for engagement in terrorism related activities. The 2006 Act on Shielded Witnesses um, allows for a special procedure in which members of the two principal Dutch intelligence services may be heard before a special examining magistrate at the pre trial stage. The magistrate can then decide in the interest of national security, whether particular information should remain secret, or whether the witness should be shielded, i.e. remain anonymous during the court trial. And again, we can discuss this a little bit more in the Q&A. But what these two procedures show is that now courts, having been very reluctant in the past to engage or even touch sensitive intelligence evidence, now perform a key function within the broader national security toolkit. They're in many respects a small cog in the big human security wheel and this is where the big problem lies in our point of view. Um, this utilization of closed evidence can have a significant impact on individual rights and human dignity. One, because you have a big divergence from the standard legal process and that is triggered by a very recalibrated approach to human dignity and the rule of law in respect of individual terror suspects on the basis of they're not necessarily fully deserving of the same rights and procedures as everyone else and we need to use this evidence against them. But more importantly, if we look at the jurisprudence, there's an inherent disparity in the relationship between the individual terror suspect and the state in the context of national security cases. And the use of secret intelligence evidence within these specialized procedures, it formalizes this inequality further. And in many respects, it hollows out the scope and the full protections of the right to fair trial from within the legal framework itself. And the right to fair trial is particularly important in ensuring that both the dignity of those on trial, as well as those who may have offered evidence, is respected. I'll stop there and leave the floor to my co-authors. Thank you very much, uh, Rumiana, for, for this compelling uh, description of the normalization of secrecy. Um, now the floor is uh, to Helen, uh, who will um, demonstrate uh, or, or explore a case where dignity has been denied, she demonstrates to, to an individual. I think it's the case of Abu Zubaydah. Helen, the floor is yours.
Hello, everyone. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, thanks a million for the opportunity, uh, not only to be part of this discussion tonight, but to be part of um, what I do think is a really special book. Uh, I have to say I really appreciated the dual focus of this book, Human Dignity and Human Security in Times of Terrorism. I feel that we spend uh, a lot of time looking at the second dimension of that. I felt I've spent too many years talking about perhaps the relationship between security and human rights. Often we do that in a very limited way, uh, balancing and trade-offs and so on. And sometimes we do it more constructively as Martin has put forward in terms of underscoring, I think that some of the most crucial lessons that we have to learn from the so-called war and terror context um, relate to the fact that of course, respect for, for human rights is such a crucial dimension to the establishment of effective long-term uh, human security. But I particularly welcomed the opportunity not to focus specifically on security, but to dig deeper on this idea of uh, human dignity. Uh, dignity can get quite a bad uh, press, I think, described as all things and, and nothing. Um, but I actually believe that the understanding uh, human dignity is really crucial to understanding the rationale, the goals, um, and the nature of a full range of, of civil, political, economic, social and, and cultural rights. And it's also, I think, uh, worth reflecting on how it's a concept that's undoubtedly uh, crucial at this particular moment in history. Um, I think we see the importance of dignity and of the denial of dignity as underpinning so many of the urgent human rights issues that we're dealing with in this moment of history and whether that's the indignity of systemic discrimination epitomized in the killings of, of George Floyd and, and others in the United States or the relationship between dignity and justice and um, that the demand of the Black Lives Matter movement uh, relates to or in the COVID-19 context I think we see also a very close relationship between this concept of dignity and the right to health even the right to die with dignity so I think it's, it's really a central concept. And of course, when we come to the counter-terrorism context that we're looking at here, um, it comes into very sharp relief. Because it's in this context, I think, that we see how the demonization, the otherization, uh, the denial of dignity has led to uh, some of the most um, excessive uh, violations in the counter-terrorism context and has been such a defining feature, I think, of the war on terror. Um, in my chapter, um, I take the case study of a man who um, I represent in international legal proceedings, um, Zain Abedin Mohammed Al Hussein, who um, is also known as Abu Zubeda. And I take his case um, as uh, an example to explore uh, the many different dimensions of human dignity that are under assault in the counterterrorism context. In terms of his case, it's difficult to reduce a very complex um, and tragic story to two or three minutes, but I'm going to try to do that with just a couple of background facts. Um, Abu Zubaydah was the first of the so-called high-value detainees. He was taken into a CIA-run uh, secret detention, the so-called Extraordinary Rendition Programme that was set up in the wake of 9-11 in order to secretly detain, interrogate and torture um, individuals outside US territory in these so-called secret black sites that were established around the world. He was detained in Pakistan in 2000, March of 2002 and he disappeared into this black site detention, uh, being detained and tortured in multiple sites around the world, Thailand, Poland, Lithuania, Morocco, Afghanistan. He was brutally tortured. He's been described as the guinea pig for the so-called enhanced interrogation techniques that we now know were approved at the highest levels. The torture was meted out with particular cruelty. It was specifically designed in order uh, to maximize vulnerability and humiliation. Um, for example, detained in a coffin for over 11 days subject to intense waterboarding, and a whole litany of mental, physical, sexual torture and ill treatment. In this particular era of, of truth and untruth, I think it's worth noting how lies and information, misinformation rather, played such a, crit a critical role in facilitating his 
uh, torture and secret detention. Um, when he was captured, he was described as the number three in Al-Qaeda. It was quickly known that that was not the case, but it was only when he got access to a lawyer many years later that that allegation was publicly dropped and it's no longer alleged that he was a member of Al-Qaeda. Cables uh, from within the CIA, which were made public thanks to the Senate Intelligence Committee report in the United States, make clear that his um, interrogators were convinced uh, quite early on that he was not withholding information, but they were told nonetheless to persist with his uh, torture. Um, the Senate Intelligence Committee report also shows um, that uh, before he was tortured, those engaged in his torture um, sought assurances that he would uh, never be released, uh, quote, that he will remain um, in isolation and incommunicado for the remainder of his life. And they were given those assurances that, quote, Abu Zubaydah will never be placed in a situation where he has any significant contact with others or any opportunity to be released. Um, and unfortunately, that's exactly uh, what has happened. He was transferred to Guantanamo Bay from Black Site detention in 2006. Um, he has been detained there ever since. Um, there are no charges that have been lodged. He still had no opportunity to review the lawfulness of his detention and no opportunity to tell his story and to respond to the vague allegations that are made against him. Despite this, the US authorities um, continue to maintain that they have the right um, to detain him as though he is falls into the category of forever prisoner who uh, cannot uh, be uh, prosecuted. They say it's not feasible to prosecute, but too dangerous to be released. So he's now been 18 years in arbitrary detention. Um, his case uh, went to the European Court of Human Rights. I was involved in that litigation against Poland and Lithuania, and they described it as anathema to the rule of law. Um, but I think exploring the concept of, of human dignity and its different dimensions in this chapter enabled me to reflect a little bit uh, more deeply or differently uh, on um, the true nature and gravity uh, of the violations of, of his rights and their impact on him, both during the rendition process, uh, but also today in his ongoing arbitrary detention in Guantanamo. And again, time is short, so I won't go through all of the different dimensions of dignity, but it's perhaps worth highlighting a couple of aspects, um, perhaps less obvious dimensions um, of the assault on human dignity that his case uh, represents. Uh, one of them that I uh, highlight in, in the chapter is this idea of the commodification of human beings. Uh, the reduction of the value of human life that his case, I think, really epitomizes. Starting with the whole notion of a high value detainee and um, the idea that individuals could be reduced to their perceived instrumental value. These were, these were people who were high value, not because they were human beings, but because they were perceived to have information. And that information could be extracted from them um, at any cost, irrespective of uh, the human cost of that and it was done of course through the brutal torture um, and enhanced interrogation technique and this notion I think of the value of the human being being reduced in that way is of course antithetical to the, the notion of dignity of, of human worth and um, that lies at the core of international law um, it was uh, on this basis that that Martin Sheenan when you were uh, the first special rapporteur on uh, terrorism and human rights. I think it was so important that you made the very uh, compelling point um, that these practices of rendition and torture threatened to turn the clock back, as you said, not only 60 years to before the UN Charter, but 200 years to a pre Kantian era, where people were not ends in themselves, but simply means to an end. But this devaluing of human life, I think, is also exposed graphically through. Uh, the rendition uh, process um, and his ongoing uh, detention in, in Guantanamo Bay uh, in terms of the complete obliteration of his, his legal rights and his legal personality. Now, during rendition, of course, you see this in a very obvious way. It was secret detention specifically designed to remove him from the protection of the law and to deny all rights. 
ensuring there was no legal or political oversight. But still today in Guantanamo, I think it's important to underscore that there's really no meaningful recognition um, of his rights um, in, in Guantanamo. And it's on this basis that it's been uh, said that his situation has shades of, of the inquisitorial civil death, uh, this idea that individuals could lose all civil rights, that somehow um, they could even be wronged or killed by others with impunity because they no longer were within but were now outside the law and laws of protection. Um, again, of course, an anathema to, to the very basic notions of, of human rights and of rule of law, but I think characterising sadly quite well um, his, his situation at the moment. Um, a related concept, perhaps, is, is the concept of uh, human dignity as very closely linked to the exercise of autonomy and agency. And some seeing, some philosophers seeing dignity as an inherently social phenomenon. So it's about the agency um, and the socialization of the individual. Um, again, his case, I think, epitomizes how that's been completely uh, set aside in his case. During rendition, this is very obvious, uh, perhaps, in the sense that it was secret, isolated interrogation uh, and detention, prolonged solitary confinement, for example, um, confinement uh, in very small boxes for prolonged periods of time, but also in details such as the way prisoners were detained and their guards, for example, as the Senate Intelligence Committee report says, the guards wore black balaclavas to keep Abu Zubaydah from seeing the security guards as individuals who he may attempt to establish a relationship or dialogue with. So complete isolation. Again, the denial of agency, I think, is ongoing in, in multifaceted ways. He's not detained, I think, very significantly. We have to underscore that he's not detained based on his own conduct and intent in the way that it would be in any criminal kind of process given that there are no charges, but rather what there are are these nebulous, uncontestable and unchallengeable notions um, of culpability, of abstract danger, really, that he represents. And I think these notions of, of abstract danger have done so much uh, harm in the counterterrorism context and are really epitomised by his case. And, you know, in fact, there's really nothing that Abu Zubaydah and others like him can do to influence his fate, the complete denial of agency and autonomy in the sense that there are no legal claims that he can bring in order to have the opportunity to challenge allegations and to secure uh, his release. So he really is in a situation of absolute powerless and denial of, of agency and, and through it, I think, uh, denial of his humanity and his uh, human dignity. The only other point perhaps in terms of the, the relationship between uh, dignity and his situation is, is to note that how we respond to the rendition program, the torture of Abu Zubaydah and uh, arbitrary detention in Guantanamo, or how we fail to respond to that, are also questions that are about human dignity. You know, the pursuit of reparation in his case, including uh, the legal claims that we continue to try to bring on his behalf are in part about recognising his humanity and recognising the wrongfulness of his, his uh, victimisation. But despite progress um, and some what I've described as the nibbling around at the edges of injustice that we've managed to do in his case, um, and there has, of course, been some progress in terms of recognising the denial of his rights and getting some kind of reparation. We're really only scratching the surface. And the fact is that, that reparation um, has not been forthcoming for rendition victims like Abu Zubaydah. Um, and I think we need to ask ourselves, what does it say about dignity and the worth of someone like Abu Zubaydah that, for example, despite the massive amount of information that's now available publicly, um, it's beyond plausible deniability that he was subject to this torture. He's still subject to arbitrary detention and that many states around the world made that possible as the European Court, among others, have found. But what does it say that we cannot secure an apology from any of those states? Um, a simple apology, recognition and apology for their role in this torture. What does that say about his value as a human being? Um, 
you know, why is it that victims of terrorism, we, we rightly focus on the importance of uh, recognising and providing reparation to victims of terrorism, um, but someone like Abu Zubaydah, it's so difficult to get any recognition or apology whatsoever. Are there deserving and less deserving victims somehow? And how does that further compound, I think, the indignity of his situation? Also, what does it say about human dignity that despite all this massive evidence that's now available, the judgments we have, the Senate Intelligence Committee report, etc., that no one has been held responsible for the systematic torture that the rendition programme uh, represented. Accountability is important for someone like Abu Zubaydah. It's an aspect of reparation. It's important because it changes the cost benefit analysis for those would be torturers like the ones that sought the guarantees of impunity before they engaged in Abu Zubaydah's uh, torture. So it's an important as part of a full reckoning, which should not be only about criminal accountability, but I think criminal accountability is an important aspect of that. And of course, that full reckoning is about preventing this from happening again. So bringing to an end the ongoing violations and preventing from happening again. And we see, of course, an assault just this week uh, in terms of the US executive order, an assault on the ICC for its uh, opening of the investigation in Afghanistan. Um, but of course, these attacks on international justice just show the importance, I think, of accountability uh, for uh, rendition and uh, other uh, so-called war on terror related crimes. Um, I've often uh, noted with irony that to my knowledge, uh, only one person has been uh, sanctioned uh, for uh, participation in the rendition program and, and that was the CIA agent who served one year in prison uh, for having leaked, allegedly leaked uh, information and he, that was the only person who had actually been sanctioned and, and I was just reflecting that maybe now we could extend that potentially to the ICC prosecutor and others. Of course there are threats to to sanction those who are investigating, so those who are part of the quest for justice rather than those who are responsible for the torture and ill treatment. So I think that, that accountability deficit poses real uh, problems uh, for the future. Um, finally, in terms of questions as to the implications for dignity, you know, what are the implications for the dignity of Abu Zubaydah um, and other torture victims that he remains in detention today? You know, the European Court of Human Rights, I think, quite wisely made clear that many states have contributed to this and that they now, those that had contributed, are now responsible for um, or have a role to play in bringing to an end the flagrant denial of justice in his case. But we do have to ask whether we have, as an international community um, of states, of individuals, of groups, whether we have and continue to do everything we can to bring to an end the ongoing violations. Um, or whether we aren't all just getting a little bit tired of one animal and losing momentum in relation uh, to, to accountability for rendition. And I think finally, just to, to circle back to, to the points we started with on the relationship between human dignity and, and human security. Um, I think we do have to ask at what price in terms of long term human security. Uh, will come a situation that we normalise this kind of arbitrary detention uh, with no charge or trial for 18 years of an individual. What will the implications of that be for human rights and rule of law elsewhere? You know, what will the implications be or if the, the current situation of impunity um, continues to persist? I think the implications will go far beyond the dig human dignity of Abu Zubaydah, but to the human rights and potentially the human security of, of many of them. So I explore that and some more in the chapter and I thank you very much again for the opportunity to be part of it. Thank you very much Helen for, for sharing this very um, compelling story that, that I think reveals how um, denials of dignity can have very organic impact so our affects directly the bodies also of the individuals concerned um, uh, and the fact that you read it in the light, light of strong theoretical reflections make really this ca case study um, really fascinating and now we will move to another form of uh, denial of dignity that affects also uh, the identity of um, these individuals 
uh, with the chapter wrote by Laura and Sangita. Laura, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity, not just to be part of the, the book itself, but also to be part of this virtual book launch. Um, as it's been mentioned, I'll speak on behalf of both myself and my co-author, Sangeeta, about the issues that are outlined in our chapter, but we're both available to answer questions afterwards. Now, our chapter focuses on deprivation of nationality. And um, by random chance, I think today is quite a good day to be talking about this issue. Uh, because yesterday a report was released by the Dutch Review Committee on Intelligence and Security Services, the Safe Day Day, um, which is one of the first occasions in which an actual evaluation has taken place of the use of deprivation of nationality in a counter-terrorism context. And so for the first time really we're starting to see some discussion, some criticism, some assessment of the utility of this measure from, from a security perspective in particular. And what makes this interesting is that it's a little bit curious that this issue has not been on the security radar and in a way it's a little bit curious that we don't know more about it in general. Um, but this actually comes from the fact that over the course of the 20th century the idea of depriving citizens of their nationality, of of banishing people for their behavior went entirely out of fashion. In fact, after the Second World War, the use of deprivation of nationality was really, came to be seen as a tool of totalitarian regimes. Um, and in the second half of the 20th century, it was really only used by authoritarian governments um, to exert some kind of demographic manipulation or to silence political opponents. But when the um, legislative fever, as Ramiana has already described, started to happen around uh, the counter-terrorism issue, and governments wanted to be, in particular, seen to be doing something, a number of politicians in a few uh, Western states stumbled across this long-forgotten tool of depriving people of their citizenship. And very quickly, in a number of cases, it came to be reintroduced and government powers were expanded. At the time, without much consideration being given, in fact, either to the security side of things and whether this would be effective and useful, or indeed to the human dignity side of things. Um, what we have seen in the period since is that these issues are slowly being explored. But as I mentioned, uh, yesterday's report that was issued here in the Netherlands is one of the first cases really of an assessment in full of the effectiveness of this tool. So there's much still to debate. In terms of what our chapter does, what we try to do is basically offer a critical exploration of de the deprivation of nationality as a counter-terrorism measure. And as befitting the book, it focuses in particular on the impact for human dignity and human security. We do this by looking at how citizenship deprivation is distinct as compared in particular to other counter-terrorism measures. And we unpack that in a number of ways. The first way is in fact by looking at the very far-reaching consequences that denationalization has for the persons concerned. And this is best articulated actually in a court case uh, from 1958 that was brought before the US Supreme Court when the government was seeking to deprive Mr. Albert Tropp of his American citizenship as a punishment for deserting the army. Um, so if you'll indulge me, I'm going to read an extract from the case because it actually allows us to unpack many of the issues that this measure brings to light. So Chief Justice Earl Warren said that deprivation of nationality is the total destruction of the individual status in organized society. It's a form of punishment more primitive than torture, for it destroys the individual the political existence that was centuries in the development. The punishment strips the citizen of his status in the national and international political community. His very existence is at the sufferance of the country in which he happens to find himself. While any country may accord him some rights, and presumably as long as he remained in this country, the United States in that case, he would enjoy the limited rights of an alien. But no country need do so because he is stateless. This man would have lost his, his only citizenship, in fact. 
Furthermore, his enjoyment of even the limited rights of an alien might be subject to termination at any time by reason of deportation. In short, the expatriate has lost the right to have rights. It subjects the individual to a fate of ever increasing fear and distress. He knows not what discriminations may be established against him, what prescriptions may be directed against him, and when and for what cause his existence in his native land may be terminated. He may be subject to banishment, a fate universally decried by civilized people. So it's something of a long quote, but I would like to use it to unpack four sides of nationality that show why denationalization is no ordinary measure. So firstly, nationality is the foundation for a person's status within both the national and international political community. It assures a person of a place and a community in which they're formally recognized as belonging. The withdrawal of nationality then leads to what Hannah Arendt has described as the deprivation of a place in the world which makes opinion significant and actions effective and has been referred to as civil death. It extinguishes a very key ingredient of a person's identity, which also cannot be readily reestablished as I'll talk about in a moment. So that's that first element. It's the extinguishing of an element of a uh, person's identity. Now, secondly, nationality operates in our modern world as an enabling right. Basically, what that means is that once the bond of nationality with a state is broken, that automatically brings to an end eligibility for political rights, for instance, like the right to vote or stand for election. But in fact, without a nationality, access to education, healthcare, employment, property ownership, social security, legal remedies, and other rights becomes highly problematic. This is something that we're really also seeing in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, where those without nationality are among the most vulnerable. So where the rights to a nationality has been denied, where the person has been deprived of their nationality, that isn't the only consequence. It has ramifications that spill over across a whole range of other human rights. And this, again, can have an enduring impact. Now, the third point that Chief Justice Warren makes is that it is a fate of ever increasing fear and distress. And this observation is really vital to appraising the measure through the lens of human dignity. The loss of status, of place, of rights, has an unquestionably deep impact on the human experience. This fact has been recognized in human rights jurisprudence before international bodies, where the deprivation of nationality and the impact that this has, has been seen as constituting a violation of the dignity of a human being. The insecurity that's generated is aggravated by the nature of deprivation as a permanent act. In contrast to a temporary suspension of rights, such as the right to free movement or to liberty through confiscation of a passport or the imposition of a period of imprisonment or a travel ban. The permanence of deprivation of nationality has caused it to be likened to a life sentence without the possibility of parole. Fourthly, in his appraisal of the implications of deprivation of nationality, Chief Justice Warren draws attention to the connection between this measure and the phenomena of banishment and of statelessness, which he describes respectively as universally decried by civilized people and a condition deplored in the international community of democracies. This really shows the situation of this measure within the current human rights normative framework, because indeed banishment is no longer considered to be a form of uh, treatment that is uh, suitable, and statelessness is also outlawed under international law. States have a duty to avoid statelessness. So within the chapter, we set the issue against this background of understanding what it is that you're actually taking away when you're taking away nationality. It sounds like an administrative act, like a technical thing, but it has very, very deep implications and it will continue to have those implications throughout a person's lifetime. If we situate this against international law, what we see is that while it, it's the sovereign prerogative of states to regulate loss and acquisition of nationality, they must do so within certain limits set by international law. One of the most important limits is the recognition of the right to a nationality as a fundamental human right. 
and the lessons that we learned from the period before and during the Second World War basically showed how dangerous the power of deprivation of nationality can be if governments allow, are allowed to use it at their full discretion. So the Universal Declaration of Human Rights explicitly prohibits arbitrary deprivation of nationality in Article 15. This has been reaffirmed in numerous international human rights treaties. So within the book chapter, we look at the substance of this prohibition, as well as how the principles of non-discrimination and the duty to avoid statelessness have further constrained the freedom that states have to strip people of their citizenship. For example, International law demands that withdrawing nationality is so shown to be necessary in order to achieve a specific legitimate purpose and that it is the least intrusive means of achieving that aim. A policy or practice of nationality deprivation that does not meet all of these criteria is by definition arbitrary. So too is denationalization that is discriminatory in purpose or in effect deprivation of nationality that results in statelessness, or that directly leads to a violation of other, in particular, non-durable rights, or withdrawal of citizenship that's executed without due process. Now, there's a much more extensive elaboration of how international law standards apply in the context uh, in the principles on deprivation of nationality as a national security measure, which were released earlier this year. They were developed following a 30-month research and consultation process in which uh, Dr. Paulison and Professor Scheinin also participated, among others, and they've already gained the endorsement of dozens of international experts and human rights organizations. So slowly, we are starting to see that the human rights angle of this issue is also being rediscovered, just as the power was rediscovered not so long ago as well. Finally, what the chapter does is also to consider the effectiveness question. For want of a better word, let's call it that. As mentioned, when many of these powers were introduced, there was not a great discussion on the question of effectiveness. And in fact, if you go back to the legislative history here in the Netherlands, the security services spoke out against this measure being introduced because they did not see the utility of depriving people of their nationality. And so, what we see because of the reintroduction of this measure happening at a faster pace than actually the unpacking and understanding of what it means is that this question of effectiveness is only now being assessed. Um, when we look at what commentators are saying, basically the unanimous opinion is that this is the wrong tool for the job. Nationality deprivation does not serve the aims that the state is trying to achieve and there are better, less intrusive means to do so. Finally, just to say that it was mentioned at the outset, my organization is uh, collaborating with Open Society Justice Initiative and a range of other partners to spearhead a year of action against citizenship stripping at the moment. Um, the aim of this is really to encourage and facilitate a more informed and a rights-based public and political debate around this measure. Uh, because there is an awful lot still to be learned and still to be said. And uh, it's really great to have the opportunity to also contribute to that this evening. Thank you very much, Laura. I'm sure that this will be um, a topic that will trigger a lot of discussion. So uh, to the audience now, uh, know that the chat is open uh, until you, you um, feel free and relax to ask your questions. I, I will have a, a question of my own to start with. Um, so maybe first to, to the editors, uh, Christophe and Martin. So I think it was very clear and compelling from your introductions how uh, this idea of humanizing security um, helps us to depart from the, the now uh, very familiar balancing test and dichotomy between uh, security and liberty. Uh, and uh, particularly clear was the fact that security needs humanizing. Um, but would you also say that if we follow this, this framework, then um, security itself could be humanizing, could be a humanizing force. So um, as, as a way to produce trust, and, and this would help us, if this is the case, then this would help us to go even further away from this dichotomy that has occupied the literature for, for a long time. Uh, then I would be also very interested uh, in hearing from the, from the authors 
why and to what extent do they find the concept of human dignity useful um, to, to, to uh, pursue your reflections on, on these issues? Or on the contrary, because of the difficulty to define uh, the concept, did it make your reflections more complex? Uh, so to what extent did it really allow you to push the re reflection beyond the usual balancing test? I, I would be very interested in, in hearing your thoughts on this. And then uh, please don't be shy in the audience. Uh, feel free to send, uh, to send your, your questions as well. Thank you. Maybe Martin or Christoph to start with. Martin, would you like to take this one? Yeah, I'll start by by saying that I I, I do think that, that that there's a prospect of uh, uh, shifting the language to human security, increasing the let's say citizen involvement and legitimacy of counterterrorism measures uh, instead of uh, contributing to cleavage between the security apparatus and the people. But I don't take it as a given uh, in the sense that even if security takes many faces, we speak of the individual right to security, we speak of an individual's right to social security, still it is also a limitation ground, legitimate aim to limit human rights, and there's a very strong collective dimension. So uh, I think any, any discourse which is based on accepting security and seeking legitimacy through that notion faces of the risk of subordinating the individual to the collective. And that's why I'm not totally optimistic. I, I think, I think uh, it's better to keep reminding that we speak for human dignity, but we are not forgetting security. We just want to address it as human security. Thank you very much. Um, that's very clear and, and convincing. Christoph, uh, do you want to add something on this? No, I, I think more in generally that um, you, you mentioned the point about security could be a humanizing force. And of course, if you see that certain measures, if they comply with human rights, with human rights framework and international law more generally, then they will be effective, as was explained by, by Laura. Now, if counterterrorism measures are uh, effective and provide security, then they will also create that humanizing force, I think. So, of course, they're always uh, balanced against each other, human dignity and human security, but of course, part of the same. Um, and you cannot balance these uh, against each other, otherwise you will get this um, sliding scale. Um, yeah, that would be my, my addition to this more theoretical question. Thank you very much. Um, Rumiana, would you like maybe to uh, tackle the, the question on, on uh, human, human dignity and the concept of human dignity as uh, helpful in your reflections or on the contrary, a complex uh, ally. Uh, thanks, Rebecca. I actually found it quite helpful, even though it is indeed very complex, um, precisely because I think human rights and some certain human rights are taking a turn for the punitive in the way they have been used by states. And what I mean by that is that a lot of states have realized that you can exploit some uncertainties or perceived gaps in the law in a way to legislate in a manner that allows you to engage in uh, onerous and stringent counterterrorism measures, but within the rule of law. Um, and as Laura mentioned, forgotten or unused for a long time power, such as deprivation of liberty, have made a very big return when up until say six, seven, eight years ago, they were entirely dormant to a point that they were unusable anymore. Um, I found it very helpful because um, in the context of the right to fair trial, um, we think of it as a human right, but it's much more complex than a right in, in a sense, because it protects so much more in the context of an individual. If we think of a human, if we say, when I think of the case of Abu Zubaydah, for example, and the very compelling case that Helen made, one of the most important aspects of the right to fair trial is one to be able to address 
the um, charges against you and within that to be able to challenge any evidence that potentially might have been obtained through the use of ill treatment or torture. Um, for many of the individuals who are put in on trial for uh, perceived or alleged counter-terrorism uh, behavior, if they are in the context of a um, closed material procedure, they have no means of actually challenging how this evidence was collected, on what basis this intelligence information was processed, who or what country was it that put it forward. And we know that there are some countries that there is an ongoing and persistent issue in the context of ill treatment and collection of evidence, and you're not allowed to challenge that. And when we think of that in the back of what the right to fair trial is intended to protect, I think the concept of human dignity and its complexity actually fits quite well in that puzzle. Thanks a lot. Uh, Helen, Laura, would you like, uh, Helen maybe? Uh. Thank you, yeah, just, just briefly, I, I did find it very helpful actually, uh, partly because, uh, precisely because of the breadth and the flexibility. I think that in a sense it invited um, a sort of broader uh, reflection and, and what I find quite interesting following on from what Liliana was just saying, um, was looking not only at human dignity in the sense of affronts to human dignity that we often associate with torture and ill treatment, but rather to look at how the whole host of different rights in different situations um, in terms of access to justice, in terms of the right to know um, allegations against you, to challenge even issues around freedom of expression, for example, as well as the right to reparation, impunity, all of these were actually about human dignity. So I found the invitation to explore the, the relationship between dignity and the host of different rights uh, was, uh, I think, was, was very interesting and useful. Thank you. Uh, Laura or Sangita, if she's with us? Yeah, Laura, go ahead. Yeah, I think um, from the perspective of a right like nationality it, that serves such an essential function to who we are as human beings, the notion of human dignity allows us to go beyond talking about the kind of practical implications of deprivation of nationality. You know, if, if I'm deprived of my nationality, then I won't be able to return and work legally in my country. But it, it's, it goes, it cuts much deeper than that. Um, and I think that that's laid to bear through also talking about this human dignity angle. And you see that also taken up in the jurisprudence around this, where because of the very um, deep cutting implications of deprivation of nationality, courts have said, well, actually, this is an infringement on the dignity of the person and it amounts to cruel and inhuman degrading uh, punishment for that purpose. So it also helps to strengthen certain human rights arguments at the same time. And the other thing that I think was really interesting as we were starting to look at this issue more closely from a human dignity perspective is that we were, we were also forced to reevaluate the discriminatory nature of the issue a little bit. So one of the things that you see in terms of deprivation of nationality is that it's a measure that is only used against dual nationals because most states recognize that we can't make someone stateless. That would really be crossing a line. And so to avoid scrutiny of the measure at all, they say, well, fine, we'll only use it against people who have another citizenship to fall back on. But what this does is, well, first of all, it makes it a not very useful measure uh, because most of the people who you might want to target, you can't actually deprive them of their nationality because they only have one. But secondly, in terms of the human dignity, it brands an entire subset of your population as not entirely worthy of their citizenship in the same way as everyone else, because now suddenly their citizenship is contingent on their behavior. Um, and it starts obviously with uh, branding that as contingent in the context of something very extreme, like joining a terrorist organization, being involved in those like, types of action. But in some countries, you also see that this has sparked political debate about using the measure more widely uh, in response to other forms of crime, et cetera. And the more you implicate a group of citizens because they also happen to have another, another nationality as somehow suspect, the more that ha that has a, an impact in terms of human dignity that goes beyond a few very small number of individuals who would ever actually be targeted. Thank you very much. 
Uh, we have two questions from the audience. Um, so uh, a first question aims at understanding what is, uh, according to you, uh, the function of international human rights institutions in combating terrorism under the rule of law. Um, so, so maybe I would uh, be eager to ask this question uh, to Martin Scheinen and uh, Helen Duffy. Martin, if you want to start. So what is the function of international human rights institutions in combating terrorism under the rule of law? Well, that's of course a very wide question and, and people usually focus on the European Court of Human Rights because it's a fully judicial body which deals with individual cases and has the possibility of issuing legally binding rulings. Uh, I think that is important and, and has been one of the main accountability mechanisms for providing uh, an avenue to justice for individual victims of the of the uh, most atrocious counterterrorism measures. But that's not the whole picture. I, th I think one has to emphasize the complementary nature of so many other mechanisms. I'm speaking of the United Nations treaty bodies, Human Rights Committee, Committee Against the Torture and others. And not only the complaints procedures, but also the reporting procedures. And from there we get to the special rapporteurs who conduct country visits, um, engage in correspondence with countries, report to the Human Rights Council, and we may get to resolutions by the Human Rights Council and ultimately even accountability through reference to the Security Council, which never happens. But, but in principle, there is a framework of international law which allows for addressing uh, human rights violations in the fight against terrorism. It's broad and wide. And, and I think while the focus has been on secret detention, uh, an arbitrary detention. I think the, the surveillance issues are also quite important. And, and so far, these cases mainly take the form of addressing secret surveillance and therefore being in abstract complaints about the contents of legislation. And uh, that means that governments will always have an upper hand in that litigation when you are not able to prove individually being a victim of a human rights violation, but you are challenging in, in abstract a regime. But let's see what the European Court of Human Rights decides in the currently pending cases before the Grand Chamber, we, whether we get some definitive conclusions as to what amounts to a violation in the framework of surveillance as part of counter terrorism. Thank you. Um, Helen, I don't want to put you on the spot, but if you have something to share on this. Yeah, just to add, I, I agree with everything Martin said, as, as usual. Um, just maybe to say, of course, uh, you know, the function of international human rights institutions, certainly so far as we are talking about um, human rights courts and, and tribunals, but I tend to focus on in my work, it is, of course, subsidiary. So it has to just be emphasised that, of course, you know, the real role lies in the national level and indeed, you know, very often what we're trying to do by going on the international level is to ensure that there are, for example, you know, there is effective uh, prevention, effective oversight, effective learning of lessons, effective investigation and accountability on, on the national level. Um, but it is, I think, in, in this context where remedies domestically are so elusive because of the political context. Um, that international remedies, I think, are, are so important. So I do think there's, there's a crucial role, it's multifaceted, many entities are, are involved um, in it, but uh, it's a crucial role, but it has to be ultimately about making national systems more effective. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, we have a last question and then I will give the, the last few words to Frank. Um, I think this question uh, is addressed uh, uh, to Rumiana, but also probably to Sangita and Laura. So it concerns administrative measures and how, um, so, so it's more, speci more precisely on secret evidence, but um, uh, the, the, um, the person in the audience is interested in uh, uh, hearing your views on how, uh, what you think about administrative measures that restrict people's rights in a preemptive manner and um, how in particular to argue against uh, those uh, in a way that goes beyond uh, tackling it from a necessary and proportionate uh, kind of argument. 
Uh, so whoever wants to, to start uh, on this. If I can tackle the secret evidence part. Um, thank you for your question. It's uh, really interesting. Um, we have to, when we think about secret evidence and administrative control measures, we have to think about the fact that there's one variety of administrative control measures, some which are effectively very much the equivalent of being imprisoned in your own home or a home, um, as if you are in um, a very secure uh, detention. What I mean by that is that the restrictions can include anything from very severe limitations on who you can meet, um, not having your family allowed very close to you in the same space, very controlled access of mobile phones, internet, groups of people that you can meet, area that you can be in, the amount of hours that you can leave your home, etc. And some which are a little bit lighter, or much lighter, and involve a lot more just restricted use of mobile phones, restricted use of internet, and it's very much depending on the allegations of what it is that you may or may not be involved in. One of the big issues with these administrative control measures is that they usually tend to be imposed on someone for whom there is some evidence available that they may or may not be engaged in some form of terrorism related activity, but not as to where you can actually successfully bring a prosecution within the criminal justice context. So because these are allegations, these measures can go on for a very long time. And a good example is the UK, where a number of individuals very shortly after 2001 started in the group that were indefinitely detained because they couldn't be deported outside of the UK. When that measure was found to be disproportionate and discriminatory because it was only applying to individuals who were not British, they were switched to control orders. When the control orders were found to be in violation, then they were switched to terrorism prevention and investigation measures. And now the new UK government has announced they're going to make a return to the control orders, but subject to what they know from the legislation and jurisprudence so far. And the individuals who have gone from one to the other to the other to the other and effectively being an indefinite imprisonment at home. The difficulty is that they can't necessarily always challenge the proportionality of the measures because they can't effectively challenge the evidence. And the issue is that what these measures involve has really grown. I will leave the deprivation of citizenship to Laura because this has been used a lot in the recent cases, especially for individuals who happen accidentally or coincidentally, I should say, not to be in the UK at the time the trial is going on. But I'll give you an example of a case where I think we can really see how human dignity can be impacted. It's an individual who used to work uh, within customs and border security in the UK, a job which requires security clearance. Um, his wife worked for a company which specializes in the provision of advice in immigration matters, including work permits, British, British citizenship and immigration appeals. There were concerns that he, in the future, would abuse his position as an immigration officer to assist his wife. So even though there was no current threat as such or evidence that he is abusing his position, because of a potential threat in the future due to his relationship with his wife, he was suspended, his security clearance was withdrawn and he was eventually dismissed from his employment because he couldn't have security clearance. This was on the back of a secret hearing and um, because it was seen as an employment matter, it went through an employment tribunal before it reached um, the administrative courts and the high court in the UK. And this is not the only case, this is one of many and similar ones. There's another one, Tariq, that has gone all the way up to the European Court of Human Rights. So these administrative measures or measures that are not exactly criminal justice measures, not necessarily admin measures, are being applied in different contexts now where secret evidence is being relied on. So even if we think that potentially the individuals that are significantly dangerous but can't be prosecuted on, so perhaps we could apply an administrative measure to them, these have really spilled out to areas which would not, I think most people wouldn't consider to be necessarily reflective of what national security policy should be. 
Thank you very much, Romina. Laura or Sangita, do you want to tackle this question? Sangita, yes. Um, yeah, I mean, there is, in, when it comes to deprivation of nationality, a significant difference in how this measure, what this measure entails from a criminal law perspective, and also on top of that, a, a, an administrative law measure on deprivation of nationality. And focusing on the letter, it it is very worrisome at this stage that a minister of justice and security has such a broad discretionary power to denationalize uh, or to strip Dutch citizenship of a person if it is if it would protect national security, which is obviously a very broad term. Um, and I'm also at the same time thinking, uh, looking at the question whether something more should be said or not. I mean, I I wonder if if that would even uh, help to uh, make sure that this deprivation of nationality is, a, is an effective measure at all or not, because um, as we see throughout time, this measure, it it's been applied in, in many different circumstances. So I don't think that at this stage, specifying it more would um, even benefit uh, uh, the situation. I don't know, Laura, if, if you have something to add to that. Maybe just very briefly again, referring to something that my eye fell on in this evaluation report that was published yesterday here in the Netherlands. There's, there's a very curious sentence in it, um, which goes to this point about administrative measures that basically says, well, where there's not enough evidence to open an investigation, then we'll deprive someone of their nationality. And if there is enough evidence to open an investigation, well, we won't do that because it would actually get in the way. So there's, there's an admission that the policy is aimed at, yes, being preemptive, but it sets the bar incredibly low. The idea that there could be not enough evidence to start an investigation in terms of a criminal investigation against you, and yet you can be stripped of your nationality, which again is, is a pretty permanent state of affairs, it is deeply worrying. But I think if, if we're to challenge that, really the winning arguments are going to be around showing that it's not very preventative. If we take, for example, the Shamima Begum case as one example, she's the most famous person to be stripped of her nationality. Well, the act of denationalization has given her celebrity status. So if she were intent on doing harm, well, she probably now has the profile as a, you know, an, an ISIS bride, etc., to be able to use her position to gather a greater following and perhaps to do more harm. So the idea that this measure can be used in this way to really reduce the threat, um, also by stranding people in a situation where the host state doesn't have the capacity to investigate and to prosecute. So it, it's not apparent really what the preventative, preventative um, gain is, and yet we're happy to use this measure against people for whom there isn't enough information to open a criminal case. Uh, that, that is a very bizarre state of affairs. And I think we need to be talking as much about that, unfortunately, as about the implications for human dignity. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you also, th many thanks to the audience. Uh, many of you stayed until the end. Uh, so thank you for, you, for your interest. Um, particular thanks to all the speakers. Uh, I think uh, your your work is fascinating and it will surely trigger interest to, to actually acquire the book. Uh, now I will give the floor to Frank um, and uh, mute my microphone. Thank you, uh, Rebecca. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to say a few words uh, to both uh, the editors and authors and uh, to all of you on the occasion of this book launch. Um, the book we are celebrating uh, today has its origins in a one-day event held at the Asser Institute on the 14th of December 2017. The editors and TMC Asser Press were quick to realize that out of the event, and the contributions of the speakers that took part, a valuable publication could be wrought. But then, of course, the writing needed to be done, additional research had to be performed, and the reviewing process took its time. We published the result in December of last year. 
And what a result, because the outcome is an innovative publication in the field of human rights research. I congr congratulate the editors, Christoph and Martin, and the authors with the book, and I thank them for their patience and possibly the sweat, toil and tears they put into all the work. Due to COVID-19, this is probably the first book launch in the history of the Usser Institute without the presentation of a first copy. I believe we can overcome that, but I very much hope we can soon meet in person again. I invite you all to visit the Usser Press website, where on the info page for this book, you will find the offer of a special discount on the list price. I also sent out a tweet uh, tonight with a link to that uh, web page. And um, I would like to finish with thanking the speakers for their contributions to this Zoom event, my co colleague Rebecca for moderating. And I thank you, the audience, for your presence and participation. And I hope to see you again at one of our events in the future, in person or in cyberspace. Thank you very much and good night.